Okay, good morning. Please look down in your notes at lecture 13, the Greek infinitive. And I already mentioned one or two things about the infinitive last week, but now we will actually look at it in greater detail. I want to remind you that what we are doing right now is giving you a very general overview of Greek grammar. And the reason we're doing that is because in classes that will follow this term, when we go to other terms, we will, we will be building on applying those things. And we will look at things like the infinitive, things like the participle, things like verb tenses and moods. We will look at those various things in greater detail. And what those things will do is they'll enable you to be able to do uh, deeper study and handling some of the interpretive challenges that we face when we are studying the New Testament. And by the way, it will get, it will get to the place where when you look, when you read uh, your, your translation English, or maybe even the Fonte, you might actually be able to figure out how the translators interpreted that particular verb, okay? You might, and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about verb tenses today, not in this lecture, but in the second lecture. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Because when we talk about the present tense, it's not just focusing on something that's happened or, or that is going on right now, but it actually talks about the nature of the action a little bit. And it actually has the idea of something that's repeated or something that is in process. And so we'll see that when we talk about uh, aorist tense, I used to think of the aorist tense as being past tense, but it's actually not. Aorist does not really describe whether it's present, future, or past. It's talking about a type of time. And so we'll, when we get to those things, we'll explain them. And I hope that, that you'll be able to understand that very well. And it will build as we go through our lesson. But the first thing I wanted to do is make a quick reminder about the verbal. Can someone tell me what is a verbal? Do you remember verbal? I'll start you out and see if you can finish. It's a noun, adjective, or adverb that functions, or, or that, that's function is a, it has what? We have something that's static and we have something that's dynamic, okay? Okay, static means it's just here. Dynamic means that it has some kind of motion to it. So it's a verb form that's functioning as adjective, adverb, or noun. Okay? You remember that one? So when we, when we talk about it being a verb form, we could have something like walk or to walk. That would be like an infinitive. Or the walking man. Do you, do you see that? It's an, it's an adjective, but it has some dynamic part to it and walk. Is, is, is a verb. So what we're talking about is the verbal. Remember, it's a verb form, can function as noun, adjective, or adverb. In English, there are three types, participle, gerund, and infinitive. In Greek, we just have participle and infinitive. Last week, we talked about participle. Today, we'll talk about infinitive, okay? So let's look at the Greek infinitive. And if you look down in your notes, I have written out what is on the slide here. And let me open this up a little bit. There we go. If I want to say I love a person or a thing, a simple substantive, remember that's another word for noun, will do fine. I could say I love basketball. I love football. I love Greek class. No one's saying that one. But what if I wanted to love something that was dynamic, not static? Well, I could use something called an infinitive. I could say, I want to say, I love an activity. So I could say, I love to sing. Do you see that? Or I love to play basketball. To play. 
and basketball actually are functioning in the same kind of way. D do you see that? So we have this thing called infinitive. It's a verbal noun, much like the participle is a verbal adjective. It's most easily recognized as a verb preceded by the word to. To study is my greatest challenge. There's an example. In this case, the infinitive to study is the subject of the sentence. Or I could say, I began to sweat when I realized exams were three weeks away. In this sentence, the infinitive to sweat is completing the action of the verb began. So when we're reading an English sentence and we see the word to before a verbal form, then we, we think infinitive right away. Okay? And so when we see the infinitive in a Greek sentence, then we need to think, okay, when I translate this, I will use the word to before the actual verbal, okay? So that's what we're talking about by infinitive. It's just another form of a verb. It's another, another type of verbal, and it can be used as a noun. It can be used in various ways, okay? Any question there? Can an infinitive have a subject? Now this is a little bit of a tricky question because technically they do not have a subject but there may be a noun that is associated with the, the, the infinitive that acts kind of like a subject. It says if an infinitive is not a finite verbal form it, is te it technically cannot have a subject. However, there is often a noun in the accusative that acts as if it were a subject of the infinitive. If the infinitive has a direct object, it can sometimes become interesting to determine which word in the accusative is the subject and which is the direct object. Usually context will make this clear. As a general rule, the accusative will be the subject and the second, the direct object. Now, as we get to some examples, maybe you'll see what's being described. But the point is that an infinitive can have a noun in the accusative that functions like a subject or that functions as the direct object of the infinitive. Remember that a participle can just be a, a word standing alone or it can actually be what we call a participial phrase. So it could have more than one word in it and it can almost be diagrammed like a little mini sentence that is connected to the, to the place that it fits on the main, on the main sentence. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? We, we can have a clause that is independent. That's our main clause. That can actually stand alone as a sentence. It doesn't need any other pieces to fit into it for it to stand alone as a sentence. Or we can have a clause that is called dependent. What that means is it's a clause. It has a verbal aspect to it. It has a subject aspect to it. It may even have a direct object, but it can't stand alone. It's, it's dependent. And so it has to be connected to another clause, an independent clause, for it to actually function in a sentence. We would call a, a dependent clause standing alone a fragment. We would call an independent clause standing alone a sentence, maybe a very simple sentence. D do you understand what I'm, what I'm saying there? Okay. So if a participle can be a clause, not just one word, and by the way, the participle has a built-in subject already anyway, okay? The infinitive can also be a clause as well, okay? But if we're looking for the subject, or it's not technically a subject, but it's like a subject, then we would look for the accusative. And if there are two, one is the subject and one is actually the direct object of the infinitive. Okay? Let's look at this example here on how to diagram an infinitive. If you look down in your notes, it says, Ethelesen, <laughs> this is a tough word, Ezelethane Galilea. Okay? So we have these three words. And notice we have one word that is the verb. That's the very first one. And then we have 
The second word, do you know what that one is? That's our infinitive. And then the third word is in the dative. Okay? So let's break this down. The first word is he wanted. And do you know why it's he? The verb is, is what? Third person. Third person singular. So it's he, she, or it wanted. And then we have the verbal infinitive to go out. Okay? And then we have Galilee. Now this is in the dative. So what do we need to supply in our translation? Two. Very good. So let's look at how I translated it. He wanted to go out to Galilee. Now I have a question. What function in the sentence is the infinitive? What, what, what is it functioning as in the sentence? Is it subject, direct object, indirect object, predicate nominative, predicate adjective? What would you say it is? Well, what, what is, um, do you see the A there? What does the A stand for, do you think? Okay. Accusative, yes. Yes, very good. So if it's accusative, what is it going to function in the sentence? As? Very good, very good. And you are, you are correct about that, okay? So this is how it would look on your diagram, okay? He, she, or it wanted, there's the verb, and then we have a line that indicates direct object, and now we have our infinitive phrase, to go out, which is the infinitive, and then to Galilee is the indirect object of the infinitive, okay? Now, that whole phrase, to go out to Galilee, is functioning as a direct object. So what did he want? He wanted to go out to Galilee, functioning as direct object. Now notice there are, there are two lines in front of to go out. That double line is how we indicate the infinitive. If we didn't have the double line, then that would be looking like a participle. Do you, do you understand that? Okay. So that's how we, that's how we show the difference between the infinitive and the participle. The infinitive has the double line and the participle would not. And then we also recognize that this is infinitive because you see the word to supplied there. If it wasn't in, if it was participle, we would actually have a subject and the subject would be built into the participle. Okay? So are, are you seeing why, why, first of all, we put it in the direct object position because it's accusative, okay? And then do you see how we diagram it? We have the two bars, and then we also see that to Galilee, because it's dative, it's going to function like an indirect object in that clause. Or, well, phrase, I, I guess technically is what we call it, infinitive phrase, not clause. Okay? So if you look down in your notes, there's a little, there's a little statement um, below that. Did I put it in there? Yeah, it's, it's in bold. The double unequal vertical line represents the infinitive clause. So that's important because you'll see that every time we, we diagram infinitive. Okay? Any question about, about that example? Let's look at a second example. This is from Luke chapter 9, verse 2. And it, can someone try to read that for us? Emmanuel, you want to try to read that? Go ahead. Okay, very good. So let's look at this quickly and try to figure out, first of all, where the verb is. Which word is the verb? Sent, okay? And it is third person singular, so how would we indicate that? 
Okay, very good. He, she, or it. Now let's look at the word them. What is them? Okay, third person plural. It's also masculine. And it's functioning as the what? The what? Accusative. Accusative, so it's very good. Direct object, okay. And then we have to preach, the, and kingdom. What is to preach? It's an infinitive, okay. And we have the and kingdom. What, what, what are they functioning as in the infinitive? Okay, why do you say indirect object? Do you want to change your answer? <laughs> it's a okay, so then is it indirect or direct object? Dative. No, no. D uh, okay, dative, is dative. dative is indirect object. So accusative is what? Direct object. direct object. Okay, very good. So we have two direct objects. Huh? We have two direct objects here. Well, what do you think? Yeah, it is. In fact, if you look down below your example in your notes, we have something called double accusative, okay? And read what it says. The double equal vertical line represents the fact that this sentence has a double direct object. Them and to preach the kingdom are both functioning as direct objects. Now, if we were diagramming and we had, we had a compound direct object, we would diagram it different than what you're going to see. A compound direct object would have, the, would have some kind of conjunction like and. But this doesn't have that. This is, this is a double accusative. It's like it has two direct objects. So let's see how it would look in our, well, let me first of all translate it. He sent them to preach the kingdom. In fact, that might sound familiar to you because it's from Luke chapter 9. So he sent them to preach the kingdom. He sent who? Them. He sent what? The mission was to preach the kingdom. So preach the kingdom and them are both functioning as direct objects. You could say he sent them stand alone. He sent to preach the kingdom wouldn't quite make sense because it seems like it's missing an element but that is the direct object okay so here's how it would look on our on our sheet right here okay I'm gonna try using this pointer <laughs> okay here's our verb sent very simple hey Maybe, I was, maybe I'm wasting time <laughs> trying it. Okay. He, she. Why, why, why did we put that in parenthesis? And how do we know that it's a third person singular? Built into the verb. Very good. Okay. I'm just not going to use that. <laughs> and then you see them, which is a, it's accusative, it's direct object. And then you have the kingdom here as the other accusative. And, and if you think about it, them to preach the kingdom, them could almost be like a subject to the infinitive. Do you, do you understand what I mean? So it's kind of hard, like what do we do with that? So that's why I mentioned earlier that if we see an accusative, it can be functioning like a subject. It's not technically call the subject but it it kind of has that sense are, are you following that so them in the accusative seems to act like a subject to the infinitive to preach the kingdom and also remember we have two accusatives it wouldn't make sense to say he sent kingdom to preach them that doesn't really make sense uh, and so that's why in the context we determine that them would be 
in that direct object position where it's kind of like the subject and the kingdom would make more sense being the direct object of to preach. Are, are you following what I... So that's sort of the explanation or allowing you to see what I was talking about where we asked the question, can infinitive have a subject? The answer is technically no, but it's kind of like kind of like a subject. Are you following that? Okay, so we have this example right here. He sent them to preach the kingdom. And I think it's actually the gospel of the kingdom, but he shortened down the, uh, the verse for the example. So it wasn't too complicated a, a diagram. But you would be able to, to diagram that. Okay, let's look at... Um, just a few practice examples. Matthew one nineteen. Can someone please read that for us? That's Eric. Would you like to try reading that one? Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 they okay, good, good job. Yeah, it wasn't the fastest reading, but it was reading. <laughs> All right. So, in our example, in our example, which which word would we say is the verb? Wanting, okay, very good. And it's MSN. So, what is, uh, what is that? It's a masculine singular. Okay, masculine singular. So, um, what would we say that is? Is that he, she, it's, which one? He. He, okay. Very good. Now, what is May? It's a negative, okay? And that is connected to the verb. So I'll just supply that for you. And then what is out 10? Accusative, so it's functioning as what in the sentence? Direct object, very good. And it's third person, singular feminine. So would we say he, she, or it's? She. And since it's a direct object, would we say she or her? Her. Okay? Because we need the objective case when we're, when we're translating it into English. We wouldn't say he is not wanting she to, to be exposed publicly. We wouldn't say that. We would say he is not wanting her. Okay? That's just some English grammar there. And then we have our last word, diegma. What is this? Okay, very good. The infinitive clause. And it, it, it's translated to expose publicly. So let's put this... First of all, we'll translate it. He not wanting to expose her publicly. This is talking about Joseph when he discovered that Mary was pregnant. And they were betrothed. And so his assumption would be that she had been unfaithful. So he, not wanting to expose her publicly, decided to put her away privately. That was what he purposed to do. So that's the phrase that we've translated there. So how would this look in our diagram? Here we go. First of all, we see our verb. It goes on the line, wanting. We see not. That's how we... Uh, how we handle that adverb that, that makes it a negative statement. We see our subject, he. We know that because of the masculine, third person, okay? And then we have her, which is autus. Excuse not autus, auten. I was looking at the, the one before, auten. And then notice you have the double line, which indicates infinitive. And the phrase to expose publicly, that's, that's our infinitive. So do you see all that? Notice there's no 
direct object here. Her is functioning like as if it was the subject of the infinitive, okay? But her is in the accusative. Any question there? That's how it looks on the, the diagram. Now, the question is, would you have gotten the diagram if you were just on your own? <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Practice is something that will, will, will help us to learn. All right? Now we're looking at Philippians 121, and we will look at part A and part B. And you know this verse. What is the, what is the verse? Do you, do, you, do you know off the top of your head Philippians 121? And to die is gain. Okay? So what we're going to do is look at it in Greek, translate it, and then put it into diagram. So here, here is the phrase. Who wants to try reading it? Emmanuel, you're, you, are, you today are the, the resident Greek reader. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, very good. Emoi to Zen Christos. Translated, to me, to live is Christ. To me, to live is Christ. And let's look at it on, on here. Now, first of all, let me make, make a comment. We don't have the verb is in the Greek. How do we know that we need to put is there? What do you think? What, what's, uh, what case is Christ in? Nominative, very good. And to live, what is that? What case? No. Do you see the N at the end? Nominative. It's nominative. So look, we have two nominatives. That means our infinitive is going to function as a nominative, and Christ is also nominative. So we have two nominatives. What are we going to do with that? Okay, well, there's no article there. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> the is there, okay? So which one is the subject? To live. to live. Very good. And what verb should be supplied? Is. Why is? What kind of verb is is? Okay. It's a being verb. Okay, it's it's from the it's from the Amy. Okay? Amy. So it's a being verb. So to live subject is in parenthesis is the verb because it's the being verb. Christ. That's predicate nominative. And then to me is dative, so what is that functioning as? Indirect object. Very good. So we could say, to live is Christ to me. Or, to me to live is Christ. You could say it really either way. Now here's what's interesting. Because of the way it's written in the Greek, it would, it would, it would follow the flow, it would reveal the flow of the Greek better to say, to me to live is Christ than to say, to live is Christ to me. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So I actually, I left off the phrase in my translation because I wanted to point that out. But you could technically say it either way, but to say, to me to live is Christ reflects the Greek better. And isn't that how our English translation works, or reads? For to me to live is Christ. So it, it does a very good job reflecting not just what the Greek says, but the order that the Greek in that particular passage. Do, do you see that? Any question on that? Uh, so how did we know that the, the article 
was for to me. I just can't see it. Okay, well, it's because it's nominative and it's it's adjacent to to live. Well, I mean, is this beside it? If if Christ was also yes, but if if we want it, if if it was if it was going to make uh, if it was going to be with Christ, then it would have been after the infinitive instead of before in the sentence. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Very good question. So that's the first part of that verse. Let's look at the second part of the verse. 21b. 121b. Apathenen kardas. It's only two words. So, which one is... Well, what is the first one, to die? It's our infinitive. What case is it? Nominative, okay. And kardas, gain, what case is that? Nominative, okay. So, applying what we've just learned, where's the, where's the verb there? It's what? It's it's a being verb. It's implied because we have two nominatives, to die and gain. We have those two together. And so how would we, how would we translate that? And by the way, here, there's no article to determine which one is the subject and which one is uh, the direct object. So we'll just go with word order here. And actually, technically, you could probably go either way with it. Gain is to die, or to die is gain, because they're equivalent phrase, they're equivalent words or statements, basically. Okay, but we would translate to die is gain, and this is how it looks on our on our diagram. So notice we have we have the two lines indicating infinitive. We have it in the subject position because we determined that the infinitive is, is functioning as the subject and gain is fu functioning as the predicate nominative. We supplied the being verb is, though it was not in the Greek, because we had two nominatives and the being verb would make sense here to say to die is gain. It wouldn't make sense to the world, <laughs> but it makes sense in the Bible, okay? To die is gain. And so our sentence reads, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And we've seen it. It's, it's, right. it's, a very, it's a very simple verse, and it's actually fairly simple to translate if we understand that the being verb needs to be supplied. If we don't understand that concept, by all means it will be a challenge, okay? So any question about that? The main thing we want to, to figure out, first of all, is that an infinitive is a verbal. We translate it with the word to. It can function as a subject. It can function as a direct object. It can function in several different ways. Okay. It can have an accusative that functions like a subject. It's not technically a subject, but we would call it double accusative. If we have two accusatives with our infinitive, one would function like the subject, the other one would function as the direct object. We've seen an example of a double accusative, and we've been reminded again that when we have two nominatives, one is subject, one is the, or one is the predicate nominative, and we supply the being verb in these situations. So that's kind of what we've gone over.